Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT races to discuss their lives, their journeys, their ambitions, and their relationships with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. I'm Chris Pritchard, and with me is legend of the TT, Steve Plater. Steve, you all right? Morning, Chris. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Thanks. Uh, it's good to be getting on with this. You know, uh, we've got a lot of podcasts to get through and to have... The fastest man around a T2 course on here first is going to be brilliant. You know, it's a, a little bit different for Pete. I'm quite interested to kind of get behind the scenes a little bit and to find out what's going on. New team, new bike and so on. So it's not all plain sailing. No, he's an interesting character, old Pete, because he, he, he appears to be very, very laid back. I've spoke to him a few times on the TT start line when I've been there. The guy looks like he's going for a, a trip down to the shops, doesn't he? Mate, Pete is even horizontal when he stops on the, the end of lap two and lap four in a superbike race. He's incredible, he really is. And that's probably one of his best ingredients because it keeps him calm even when the pressure's on from, you know, his fastest competitors. I mean, shall we get into it? Yeah, let's crack on. Our guest for today's episode of the TT Podcast is Peter Hickman. Since making headlines with a record-breaking debut in 2014, Peter has firmly established himself as the man to be at the Isle of Man TT races. Five podiums from five races in 2017 confirmed he was a man set for glory, but it was his performance at the 2018 TT that cemented his place in the history books. A maiden TT win came in a record-breaking and eventful Superstock race, and later that week, he doubled his tally with an incredible victory in the headline Senior TT, a race that many now consider as one, if not the greatest TT races ever. I think my co-host might have something to say about that, but we'll see later. A race-long battle with friendly rival Dean Harrison went down to the wire, culminating in Peter's last lap of 16 minutes and 42 seconds, the first and to date the only ever lap at the TT Mountain Course at an average speed of over 135 miles an hour. After three race wins in 2019, he joined an illustrious club of riders who have taken a hat-trick of victories in a single TT meeting. For most competitors, the TT fortnight is the most stressful and intense two weeks imaginable. But for Peter, it's arguably a welcomed holiday, as the other 50 weeks of the year are spent running his own motorcycle performance centre supporting the next generation of racers in the Ovale UK Cup and competing in the Bennett's British Superbike Championship. A relaxed approach to the TT races is a sentiment he shared in interviews before, saying that when he comes to the Isle of Man TT, it's to enjoy himself, to have some fun, to pull some wheelies and do some skids. And it just so happens he's pretty blooming quick around there too. Peter Hickman, welcome to the TT podcast. That was a hell of an introduction, wasn't it? Pretty good, eh? <laughs> You've done well there, thanks. Straight off the top of my head. I've got my tenner ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> you good? Yeah, really good, thank you very much. Yeah, spot on. Good. So, I mean, Steve. Oh, the... yeah, he's all right. <laughs> yeah. It's the, I mean, it's the first TT podcast, and what a guest we've got on to start it. Arguably one of, you know, the fastest TT riders in the world. Yeah, pretty impressive. You know what it's like, flipping Ecky, uh He's just annoyed. I nicked his sector record. And the him. trouble is, is, he's going from strength to strength. The only good thing is, he's keeping that sector record in Lincolnshire. But no, no, very impressive, you know. And what do you, do you know? What obviously Pete's been winning out the TT for two years. He's clocked up a load of wins already, and going from strength to strength. But uh, question is, can he keep it up? Who knows? That's the thing, isn't it? Especially with this break that we've just had. Do you think that's going to help or hinder? Uh, to be honest, I think anybody um, anybody who's fast anyway it won't really make any difference to. Um, from an outsider point of view, I don't know what Steve thinks, but from an outsider point of view, people think, oh, it's going to be a lot slower next year and all the rest of it. I don't think so at all. Um, you know, if I didn't turn up Oldham Park for the next three years and then I went back in year four, I wouldn't be any slower than what I would be now, you know. So um, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of tarmac and we're going to race bikes around it. And we've done that before and we've done it at over 135 mile an hour before. So there's nothing to say we can't do it still. So two years off, we're going to ask every rider that we have on the podcast this question. That tap on the shoulder. So obviously you get up in the morning, chill out, and uh, I know what you're like. You're quite relaxed on your approach to the TTs, but you know you go through all the all them wallies with TV cameras and things, trying to ask you silly questions just before the start of a race. But you roll down to that big arch on the Glencrutchery Road, uh, would pop the visor down. 
what are you actually what's actually going through your mind when you get that tap on the shoulder not too much to be quite honest <laughs> not that i have a blank expression on my face or anything but um no I, I, yeah like you said i'm i'm pretty horizontal anyway i'm pretty relaxed about the whole well life really not just tt just life in general i'm pretty relaxed about i think i turned up here 6 minutes before it was meant to start so yeah you know it's um uh, i'm a bit like that in general but uh that kind of you get that you probably get what about 40 seconds would you say from the last person you get to see um until you set off down the road so normally it's Daz, my mate who gives me a good tap on the shoulder and and a shake of the hand as well and said you know stay safe that's pretty much the last person who talks to me always and then you go through that section from the last barrier where nobody else is allowed past apart from riders and machines until you get that proper tap on the shoulder to go and uh, you get about 40 seconds and because i'm number well i have been number 10 now for three years um there's always a good few riders in front of me so you get that little bit of space to think for yourself um I'm normally thinking about fuel, so I'm already, I've already got the bike turned off because I don't want to waste that last egg cup of fuel in my fuel tank. Um, so I've got the bike off until I literally roll up to the line for the last 10 seconds. Um, I want to make sure it's in gear, make sure the clutch is feeling right. And I don't take it back out of gear once I'm in gear because the last thing you want to do is set off in neutral or in second gear. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I do. Make sure the wheel's on the line. And then set my revs somewhere. I count in my head from 10 as, as the rider in front sets off. I go kind of 10, 9, 8, 7. When I get to 5, I pick the revs up and then wait for the, for the guy to give you that tap on the shoulder. And then all hell breaks loose. So you just mentioned a number there. Setting off number 10. You're the fastest man ever around the Alaman TT course. Why not number one? Uh... I don't like it. No, I, I like number one. <laughs> Obviously, number one's good. Um... I've only ever actually set off once in practice at first. Uh, it would have been in year three for me. So I was on the Kawasaki, the official Kawasaki that year. And I set off in practice. Cause so when you're numbered, uh, anyone who doesn't know, but when you're, when you're a seeded rider, the top 20 always set off in practice first, but it's not necessarily in number order. And I've always wanted to try and get as close to the front as possible. And eventually in year three, I did it. I was actually number five that year. Um, but for one of the nights of practice, I managed to set off first and I hated it. <laughs> I really didn't like it. I didn't like the feeling that I was the first person around for the for the last hour that I had like rabbits jump out and birds fly. I couldn't see any tire marks on the track. It felt really dusty. I just didn't like it. And I thought I didn't. The, my second lap was way better. But my first lap, I was horrendous. And from that moment onwards, I, I've then had this feeling in my head that actually I don't want to be number one I don't want to be the road sweeper as McGuinness always calls himself I he, he likes that I don't so I, I would rather sit further back um, and then in uh, the year after that so I was five in year in year three so in year four they gave me number 10 I don't actually know why I think it was really to try and kind of space me and Dunlop and and Dean out a little bit because um, when I was five my, Mickey D was six so I was getting to learn off him which was actually kind of the point of the reason I was put there was they knew I had some speed, but I didn't have a lot of experience because it was only year three. So they put me in five with Mickey D six. Every race he would pass me within half a lap usually, and then I would at least get a section or two to follow him and understand a little bit. But obviously by the end of year three, I did 132 in year three. So I was already not far away. So then they tried to space us out so that we don't get near each other and they pull other people through. Like David Todd was number eight, I think in 19 in the super sport class. Same reason, you know, every, every race I would pass him within half a lap or a lap or whatever it was and then he'd get a chance to learn off me so I don't mind being 10 and I don't mind being further back I think it works for and against with the back markers sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad depends on the race if it's like it was in 19 it really didn't matter at all because all the races were really short apart from the final one um when it gets to the big six lappers, it, it can really just depends on how many bar, bat markers there are and if they've had problems and if they're slower than they should be, then you catch them earlier or not. Depends. It's it's just one of them. But I don't I don't mind being number ten. I think it's a it's a nice number as well. It was Granty's number, wasn't it? Ten. Yeah, so famous was, number ten, Mick Grant. Yeah, so not 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 a bad number to be uh, racing around the TT with, and it's got a one in it, so it's not too <laughs> it's not, it's not all bad, is it? <laughs> but I guess being the fastest, you you would get to choose, pick and choose. Um, if you wanted yes and no um there was a sponsor so before obviously tt 2020 got cancelled but there was um we were going to be sponsored by quite a biggish company and they were adamant i had to be number one right um because they were bothered about having the picture of the bike with number one on it and their branding on it and all the rest of the bull but 
Um, I really wasn't that keen. And I actually sat in a meeting with them and I went, okay, do you want a picture with a number one on it or do you want to win the race? Because that, <laughs> yeah. that was literally what I said to them. And their still answer was, we want the picture and you to win the race. <laughs> well, clearly. <laughs> and I said, well, it might be one or the other. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> but, it could happen. But... Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it, the plan was then that I was actually going to be number one. But um, I think if I have my way now, I'll probably start turning again. Yeah, I mean, we could, we'll get back on to 2018, 17, 16, 14. <laughs> Let's go even further back. Back to when you, you, your dad was a, a TT racer. Yeah. Won a Manx TT, he what did. was that, 77? 77, yeah. And then he went to the TT in 78 yeah. and raced it. Is is this where your TT blood comes from or, or not? Because am I right in thinking that he he didn't actually he yeah, he didn't didn't push you into bike. it? No, not at all, no. He didn't want you to ride a bike at all or just go to the not TT? Not at all. Really? Not at all. And especially not road racing. <laughs> so how then? How did you get uh, well, into it? I still grew up around it. So um, my dad had a short career, 73 to 79. Real bad accident at post-TT at Mallory Park in 79, which put him in the hospital for two years. 18 months, actually, he was in really? hospital for, yeah. Um, so pretty much out of it. Yeah. Um, broke... Pretty much everything, uh, shoulders to, to knees, uh, pelvis in five places, back, neck, ribs, all ribs bar two, both lungs, all like literally did everything. Um, so he was in pretty pretty bad way. If you see him hobbling about the paddock now, he's got about fifteen hundred quid worth of titanium in him, <laughs> still from eighty one when they finally did the last surgery to to fix him properly. Did so that, that did that finish his career? Yeah, so that finished his career. He actually did ride afterwards, although he wasn't supposed to. He didn't he never raced again. Um but he wanted to ride just to make sure his head was alright, which uh, he went to Donington Park and, and lap within within the lap record on RG five hundred and went, Yep, yeah, I'm alright and, and then mate. basically never rode again pretty much. He's on the odd parade but nothing. Um so he was um Became a development engineer um, for all sorts of different companies and race teams and all sorts. So, I when I was born in the late eighties, uh, I grew up around it. You know, he was part of the big JPS Norton uh, mm -hmm. development. Um, so I grew up around the paddock with them and also the Duckham's Nortons later on in 93, 94. Um, 1991, he did a whole Grand Prix season with Ian McConaughey uh, on a 125. So my dad was actually running the 125 for him in a Grand Prix series. So he, at four years old, I did half of the Grand Prix series, which I can't remember all of it, but I can remember bits. You were around it though, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, I grew up around it. I think 96, I think he retired. He was part of Honda Britain in 95. Then I think it was Duckham's Ducati with... Colin Seeley, the late great Colin Seeley was always a, a big kind of part of my dad's career towards the end of his career and then when he retired he kind of pushed me into darts, football Anything golf but. <laughs> darts <Yeah. laughs> Uh, you think I'm kidding. I am not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I could never be a darts player. I can't drink beer. Yeah, you're it's screwed. Just, yeah, yeah. You I, think, I think your size would be more like basketball, <laughs> not flipping football yeah. or darts. True, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, was, it was low risk, high wages. That's what he looked at. But, um, yeah, my answer to that was, well, actually, his downfall was we went to, because um, obviously he knows everyone in the paddock, um, as he still does now. But I think it must have been... It had been late 90s, uh, one of his uh, apprentices, if you like, from back in the day, ended up running Castrol Honda. Mm -hmm. At one point, Craig Webb, he was team manager, I believe, for, for Castrol Honda around that late 90s kind of time. They had Kurt McCarthy was running for them, and McGuinness, I think it was. I'm sure right. it was John McGuinness on the 600. Um Carl Mogridge was around them sort of days as well, and and Colin Silly had asked my dad to ha if he could help Carl at Cadwell because he was really struggling. Obviously, come an Aussie come over from Australia to have a look. I was must have been then about so it must have been ninety seven, ninety eight because I was ten or eleven years old, something like that. Anyway, the point of the story <laughs> that I'm getting to <laughs> is <laughs> um, Casey Stoner was there, Chaz Davies were there, and they were both riding uh, a pretty super team one two fives, and both of them were twelve years old at the time. So I sat watching that, thinking, oh, I'm eleven years old i can do that in a year and my dad's like absolutely not we're not here for that you literally come for because i'd kind of forgotten about bike racing because i'd yeah. been out of it for a for a, a few years that was it for me that was a big switch flicked over in my head and i was like well i don't care what he thinks i'm off to get a bike so i actually bought my own bike a year later an ar50 kawasaki in a wheelbarrow which didn't run hadn't run for probably 10 years where'd um, you find it uh so I, I was doing judo at the time we're talking about whatever other sports he could push me into i was um doing national level judo as so i was off around all the country doing all sorts of stuff like that and um one of the guys 
or one of the lads I was with his dad had had an AR-50 I don't know how we got into that conversation but we did Brilliant. and uh, I ended up swapping my radio controlled aeroplane because my dad's always been into aeroplanes and radio controlled stuff as well so I had one obviously uh, so I swapped that and 50 quid which took me a year to save I got a pound a week that's all I used to get um, yeah 50 quid and my radio controlled plane and then I hid the bike around the back of the house because I didn't tell my dad I'd bought it <laughs> he must have known it was around there though surely yeah he did three weeks later when he found it <laughs> <laughs> So, what did he say? Um, yeah, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the best conversation we've ever had, I don't think. <laughs> but I think he decided if I was going to do it anyway, he would then help me and yeah. push me or or teach me to do it correctly rather than doing it the way that he had to do it actually, which was learn all all himself, you know. Mm. He got so, he's got so much experience even now. He's an old man now and he's 73 or whatever he is. He's uh but he's um you know, he's got so much experience and he cut my learning curve so fast. Yeah. I've always had a really good relationship with my dad anyway. Um, so if he said, look, you need to do it this way, not that way, I would do it the way he told me. Whereas I know a lot of father-son relationships, you do the opposite. Mm -hmm. I was never like that with my dad, at least not when it came to riding or mechanicing or anything along them lines. He always made me clean my bikes and stuff as well. I, I was not allowed to ride it unless I clean, cleaned it from wheel end to wheel end yeah. after each round. It, it was very much kind of like, if you're going to do it, you're doing it my way and that's it. Can you can you believe what you're listening to? Your dad told me not to get a motorbike. <laughs> I know. You don't well, really yeah, apart to. from that bit. <laughs> <laughs> that bit I did the opposite with. But once I got one... That was it. Yeah, was you know, if he said, look, this is what you need to do, and you need to break around here, and this is how you do it, and... You know, I've I've always been. In fact, funnily enough, we're talking about whether I um I listen to him or not. The, the deal kind of was right from that point was I'll help you ride and I'll help you race if that's what you want to do. But you're never going road racing. I'll never talk to you ever again. That was actually the conversation we had. I will never talk to you again. Yeah, yeah. He literally said you'll I'll, you'll not see me. You'll not like everything stops immediately. Um, <laughs> but at any point during that at the start were you thinking of road racing no not at all it wasn't actually something I was ever interested yeah. particularly in I, I always listened to it and watched it and um, especially once you start racing properly obviously you get to know people like John McGuinness and you know the legend that he is and I would I would listen I would literally sit at home with the TT radio on listening to first night practice and all that. I, I was that geek listening yeah, yeah. on the radio you know and I was not because I wanted to go and do it I'd never even oh, I went as a one year old kid or something with the Nortons but I'd never never been back since. It was only a lot later in my career once um, BSB was not going the way that I needed it to go and I was struggling to find a ride and all the rest of it and I wanted to keep riding. You know, there's... Um I didn't go to the TT for money. Let's let's say that anyway. That no, money was never been a driven part of m me um, in life. Never mind racing. Um, but what I wanted to do was continue racing bikes, and I got to a point where I couldn't do that in BSB unless I had a lot of money, and I'd never had a lot of money. So the way that I could go racing and wasn't going to cost me a fortune was to maybe look at going road racing and. I was 27 when I did that, so I was much, you know, I wasn't 17, I wasn't 18, I'd had a good go at short circuit race and it wasn't working out, so I wanted to do something different and TT's part of that, something different. <laughs> so so wh why wasn't it working out? Why didn't you feel like you were getting where you were, you wanted to? Uh, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> I, I remember, because I remember years ago, yeah, I'll say years ago, it makes us sound really old. You are, Steve. <laughs> However, yeah. uh, I was I was contracted to Factory Kawasaki at World Endurance and you came along and jumped, I think it's one of the old, yeah, early was. 2007 that was, yeah. Yeah, you come and jumped on, a, he had a big crash at Magna yeah, Coring, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you was, you was getting some decent rides at that time, but obviously not financially gaining. Yeah. No, I never got paid. Um, the first time I ever rode a bike that I actually got paid for was 2013. So I had been racing for 11 years at that point. So, and I'd been racing at British Championship since 2004. So actually, you know, within a couple of years. And going back to what I was saying about my dad, my dad cut my learning career down, like, well, sorry, my learning curve down to like next to zero i went from so i never rode a bike at 12 years old so i rode my first bike at 12 i rode a british superbike at 17 <laughs> so i went from zero to a superbike in within five years That's i didn't ra i didn't race it at 17 but i rode one at 17 like a full-blown full-blooded brit superbike uh, and i raced one at 18 actually so the year after Bloody but hell. yeah there's not 
there won't be many people that have gone from zero riding like nothing to a superbike within five years. In fact, I don't know anybody else who's done that. And it was only because of my dad, mm -hmm. um, just because he could teach me correctly. And I would just do, if he said do that, that's what I did. So, um, you know, and, I, and I've never been much of a crasher. And I think that's down to him as well, because he, he wasn't a crasher really, because back in the day, nobody was that much of a crasher. Because if you were, you definitely weren't around for very long, because, you know, yeah. the tracks were dangerous. You know, the short circuits were dangerous, just like the TT was. Um, but he definitely did have a few crashes in his career, and he was a bit hot-headed. But yeah, I've not—I've never really been that way, and that's because of him. And it's all been self-funded all the way up to that point of pretty of much. Going to the yeah, TT. I mean, I, I got really lucky in, in a lot of respects. Even starting out, like my my dad never had, or my family's never had money. But what we had got is knowledge with him. Yeah. So like, even as an early career, when I started mini moto racing, which was my eventual way into racing, it was on the pretense of guy. His name's William Kirkham, who doesn't race anymore, but he would have actually been a really good rider, really talented. His dad got a little bit of money, not a lot of money at all, but he got a little bit of money, um, but no mechanical knowledge. So how it turned out was uh, one of his family lived in our village, which was John Kirby. God bless him. He was the guy who got me into racing, really. They gave me his spare bike to say, come and have a go, but you mechanic the bikes in the week, and then you can come and race our oh, spare nice. bike on yeah. a weekend. And that's kind of how it started. So he was kind of bankrolling it almost you know but my dad was then mechanic the bikes because will was was good he was a top three rider but his bike would break down 50 percent of the races so he was not finishing anywhere so once my dad started doing the bikes he started being top three all the time and was winning championships and stuff and then i got to, to ride the bike on a weekend as well so and this that, was super teens that was mini motos and right. then into super teen as well mm -hmm. so he he bought the bikes for the next year when we went super team 125 which actually i had casey stoner's bike from the year before there was Did a team have... called lloyd lifestyle was the team yeah. john lloyd was the was the kid i believe and then there was casey stoner was his teammate so He's, i had stoner right. yeah i had stoner's bike and will had um will had john's bike and uh, yeah we had a little uh, two man team so I'm more interested in listening to this conversation with your father in 2014 <laughs> when you suddenly dropped the bombshell. bombshell. I'm going to go to the Isle of Man TT and try and compete. Yeah, well, they knew something was wrong because I took him out for a meal. <laughs> <laughs> who's, he got, who's he got pregnant? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's probably half of what they were worried about. They were yeah. like, oh, dear. Yeah, I took him for a meal somewhere. I was like, oh, what are you doing on Thursday? Or whatever it was, I can't remember. And I'd already, I think... I think I'd already even been over to the TT and done a bit of a, a recce of oh, the... Really? I'd have been in 13 just to go and watch, as just as a bit of an idea. Um, and what really triggered it, I played the PlayStation game a lot, the, P the old PS2, the PS2 game. Yeah. I played that loads as a kid. And subconsciously, I'd taken loads of the tracking. So in 2013, I just went to watch, just as a punt. I was there for three or four days. I, I bought a plane ticket. I had nowhere to stay didn't know who was there, not there. I literally just bought a plane ticket and went over by myself. Met some friends on the plane who I had not seen for, for years. They were like, oh, wait, where are you going? What are you doing? I was like, I have no idea. I'm just going to the paddock and then I'll figure it out Brilliant. from there. <laughs> Again, this whole horizontal, relaxed <laughs> yeah. person, that, that is me. I literally Whatever. booked it the night before and then just got on yeah. a plane. Um, they said, oh, well, we've, we've got a taxi. Just jump in our taxi. They they sent me off and they helped me out loads. Chris and Sue, their name is. And... Uh, um, it went from there, really. I, uh, I borrowed his bike, and, and actually, I got to the paddock, and I, I tell you, I, I got to the paddock, and Dave O'Johnson was just pulling out to do a lap in his car, and he was like, Icky, what are you doing here? I was like, oh, I've just come for a, for a lap. He went, oh, I'm going for a lap, jump in. So I jumped in with him, chucked my bag in the back, and off we went. And he was like, oh, have you been before? I was like, no, no, I've never been before. And he was like, do you know the track? And I was like, well, not really, because I've never never been it. And then I was like, oh, but down here, you go through there, and then you go right, and then you go left. And he goes, oh, you have to not. I was like, no, 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 I'm just remembering from the PlayStation game yeah. what, what, what should happen next. And I got probably half of what the track I actually got correct, because yeah. he started, like, playing with me a little bit, and going kind of, well, what's next then? Well, what, what about here, and what about that? And... And then I, I guess that kind of planted a little bit of a seed of going, oh, if I actually put my mind to it, I could I could do that no problem at all because I already kind of knew half of it. And, yeah, the ball kind of started rolling from there. Well, what was the biggest eye-opener of the TT course for you, spectating in 2013? Uh, what what just, kind of places did you go and watch? I watched in a few places. Um, Crosby Jump was a good one. I've got an, a good memory of Rutter on the. He was on the official blade that year on the Honda, and he did one massive jump in practice over that that was ridiculous. And I've never seen anyone do it before or since. And when I spoke to him afterwards, he, he 
definitely crapped himself. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't he on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> he basically did it flat and just tried to use the rear brake, and it was the only time he'd ever tried to do it. And he did he did Crosby jump at in six gear flat chat and just tried to hold the rear brake but honestly he must have jumped 50 meters it was massive but the bike went sideways in the top and that's the problem with the crosby jump as steve will know if the wind catches you wrong or if you just take off a mill one way or the other the bike just continues to travel you can't it's not like a motocross bike you can't pull them straight yeah, yeah. if they start to move they just keep going so whereabouts on the course are we at crosby there You're how far in six miles six miles in yeah it's a sixth gear jump you know it's very it's very fast it's and in, so it's a jump it's not you know you can't go over it without jumping no not but really you, you kind of you just you try and move over to the right hand side of the road because yeah, less the, of a jump on the right less of a jump on the right but it, however it's still a big jump and obviously you, you've probably done 180 miles you've got to be yeah it's over 185 miles just, yeah. just as casual as that just guys. as casual yeah, as you know it's just a jump <laughs> in the road good photos obviously actually yeah i think it was it'll be 2008 i was on on the on the r1 on the yamaha and um the wind was quite strong that year but uh it was getting under my body and I was kind of like Superman on top of the bike. <laughs> really? Yeah, getting under me and, and not the bike. I used to hate the jumps. Yeah. I don't. I don't really do motocross tracks very well. And yeah, for me, two wheels should be on the ground, not in the air. At all times. There are no wings on any motorcycle. Well, there are. No, there no, are now. No, there are now. But well, there's actually, to keep the wheels down. I mean, I mean, wheel wings. <laughs> <laughs> so back back to 2013. Sorry, going off track. The, 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 the seed has been set. Yeah, the seed has been set. You, you're about to tell your dad. Yeah. So then. Um, I can't remember quite who I spoke to first. I know Paul Phillips had spoken to me already way previous about going to the TT, and I said, no, it's not something I'm ever really interested in, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know if then I'd gone back to him and said, actually, changed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it would have been a good few years later. It was probably seven or eight years later. And then I think I told him, because I knew Shuey, I'd obviously, Paul Shoesmith, God bless him, had done loads with newcomers um, throughout many of the years, uh, and I'd, I'd raced against Shuey a lot back in 2004 in Superstock Cup and all that sort of stuff. So I basically went to him. I liked the BMW. I'd ridden BMWs already. He was a BMW team, if you like. They were his own bikes. He wasn't supported in any way, but that's what he ran. So I kind of went to him and said, look, I'd be interested in doing this. I went to Paul and said, I'd be interested in doing it. I'd like to do it with Shuey if I could. I know him. I know. I understand the bike. I know the bike. I'll bring my own mechanics anyway, um, just for my own peace of mind. And uh that's pretty much how it started. And then, yeah, I asked my mum and dad, do you want to fancy going for a meal? What are you doing on Thursday? Or <laughs> They thought I was either getting married or got someone pregnant or something. But no, it wasn't. It was, uh, I'm off racing still and I'm going to the So he's probably happy with that. That was probably the best yeah, of the three know. options. I don't know if that was out of that. <laughs> You'll have to ask him. <laughs> and was dad one of the mechanics first year? He wasn't actually, no, but he was there. He was there, of course, as he is all the time. He always goes to every single... In fact, they pretty much never missed a round. The only place they've not been to with me is the northwest um just because logistically it's quite hard work and they they love being at the isle of man and they actually go for about a month every year so so it's like they take the caravan and they go the week before and then they leave a week late because they absolutely love the island anyway um so they make a big thing of that rather than doing the northwest but um yeah they're normally at every single round Wow. So you so you went in 2014, but it wasn't about money. It was solely about. I wanted to keep riding bikes. It was bikes. solely about riding bikes. It wasn't yeah. about trying to be the fastest rider no, no, around no. the and TT. And it cost me money or... actually in the end. You know, I mean, TT helped out a lot. They helped me with, um, you know, as many as many flights as I wanted to get there and go around and around in a hire car. They helped out loads with that mm. hotels. Anything I needed as far as that was concerned was all sorted. They sorted my ferry out for me. So I was like, for me, I was like, I felt like I'd won the lottery. Yeah. You know, but but everything else. I had to pay, so, um, you know, it did actually cost me to go to the Northwest and TT, tyres and fuel and all the rest of it, um, but it was a lot less than going BSB racing, and, uh, yeah, I managed to obviously do all right at both. So, just talk me into the first part of your first ever lap around a TT course. Was it the usual hickey, relaxed fashion, or was you a little bit uptight for the first time? No, I was, I was absolutely fine. I was so excited. And, Come on. Yeah, and the Saturday, Really? Yeah, and the Saturday, <laughs> I had to wait another 48 hours. I was gutted. We got up onto the start line on the Saturday evening, it was. We got onto the start line in leathers, in kit, ready. Bike was just about to come off the warmers, and it pissed down with rain. I, I can't believe it. And then they were like, yeah, that's it until Monday. So I had to wait two days. Oh, I had really? to wait 48 hours to 
actually then get my first lap. And the first lap as a newcomer, obviously, you do it behind um, one of the riders that, that takes you. It was Milky for me. Um, and Milky set off in front of me. I think it was on a standard road R6, and he popped a little wheelie. So I did a wheelie all the way down Glen Clutchy Road on my first ever <laughs> lap, Show off. which apparently nobody's ever done. <laughs> 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 it was only because Milky did it. He did it. I thought, yeah, great idea. So Let's I just bar- straight behind him. <laughs> and how was it? Mint. Did, oh, absolutely. did yeah. you know the cut by by that time? Yeah. Did you know where you were going or? So I could have talked to you all the way around it, no problem at all. But mm-hmm. there's one thing knowing the course, and there's another thing doing it at speed. And knowing the yeah, course. Yeah, it's, it's it's very different. So yeah. um, I knew my way, but I didn't know my way at speed. So um, my first my first lap behind him was fine I had no problem at all never got lost anywhere but then it's quite simple because you've got someone to follow you just do what they do Yeah. Um, you then by the time you come back in everyone else has gone you fill your tank back up so you can get two laps in and then you set off for two laps my first lap was 109 mile an hour average so I actually was fairly quick for a first what, first go what bike are we on here? BM so right. I took a all I took in my first that's another thing that I did in my first year is I really I wanted to concentrate I'd been racing British Superbikes for eight years, I think, at that time. British Superbikes are really hard to ride. Super Stock Bikes are not that hard to ride in comparison. They are, but they're not compared to BSB Bikes. So I took a Super Stock Bike to the North West and the TT. I raced them in the Superbike classes, but as a stocker. So for me, I'd taken like two or three steps back in bike compared yeah. to what I was used to, but the track was different. So for me, the bike was really easy to ride, but I just had to learn a new track. And I didn't take a super sport bike. I didn't take a super bike. I didn't take a lightweight. I didn't have anything. So right. all I had was that one bike. Didn't have to think about it. I had one set of gear changes, one set of braking points. You know, everything was the same. Every time I rode the bike, it was the same. The only difference um, was when the Superstar race would run on treads and Superbike race had run on slicks. That was it, which really they don't feel that much different. Can I just pick up on that then? So when you're riding a Superbike compared to a Superstock, there's different braking part uh, points yeah. and different gear yeah, changes. Yeah, because the brakes are different, the suspension is different, the really? engine's got more horsepower, more speed, it's lighter, so then you can brake later as well. Your brakes are generally stronger, so you can brake a bit later. So for Pete Hickman, of course, you know, being as relaxed as you are, uh, and starting off on your first TT assault, you're still the fastest ever newcomer, you still hold the record. Yeah. What's I... the mo- What was the most difficult part of the course, or which sector out of the six is, was the hardest for you to uh, get at one with? It was the Bishop's Court section, actually, yeah. I didn't. There wasn't many places I struggled with. That was the one place that took me a, a good while. I would say it took me at least a week before I was comfortable. So again, where where because so I know it roughly, and jump. but so Kurt Michael, yep, Renkel and jump, yep, and then you come into the Bishop's Court right, section. Okay. So after the Renkel and jump, the right hander I was not too bad with, but then that whole left right section to Alpine, and it's only really quite a small section there, but it's really fast, six gear, so it's under an eighty mile an hour plus. I kept rolling when I didn't need to roll. You can actually do it pretty much pinned all the way through. How many miles in? Fifteen miles, am I guessing at that? Um, yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah. yeah, it must yeah. be. Yeah. Oh, no 16 miles. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll have a go next year. Yeah, you're all right. <laughs> what, on your cycle? Yeah. <laughs> on a bicycle. Yeah. Oh, you're brave. <laughs> I'd probably do it faster on a bicycle than, than a metal bike. But yeah, that one section, especially when it's closed in under the trees, I, I struggled to fit. I struggled to fit. Every time I got to it, I wasn't sure. I kind of knew, but I wasn't sure, so I'd always roll. And it took me, yeah, it took me a while before I could do it without rolling. It's fun, isn't it, how, you know, different riders, different sections. Uh, but for me, that section, I thought it was some really good mark and it was, it was, uh, I was at one with it much quicker than other yeah. places, you know. But uh, it, uh, but it's very tunnel vision yeah. through the trees. And I think and, maybe that's what it was. It yeah, was maybe unsettling it, it me a little bit. It that apprehension just yeah. to go flat chat, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you look for something completely different within the scenery to try and gauge your markers and your positions on the road? Every rider is different. Every right. rider picks up on different stuff. Right. Yeah, this is the odd thing that we'll all agree on, like a particular tree or a painted line or whatever, yeah. but but I think everyone, even short circuit racing, everyone picks up on something different. Right. It's whatever comes natural, I think, is the best, best the, way. the most important part is to have those markers because yeah. people are using the same lines near enough on, yeah. on the same type of bikes, of course. Um, but yeah, you, you you need to have those markers, or, or you're in a whole world of hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. You only get you only get one chance every twenty well, that, twenty that's couple of minutes. That, to, that's the to, difficult to, thing is is you've to, got to twenty minutes each out. time between before doing it again. You, know, yeah. you go to a short circuit that maybe has twelve corners, and you're doing it every minute and a half. Yeah. So you, every minute and a half, you get to do that corner again. 
at TT, there's 260-ish, they reckon, somewhere around there. Yeah. And you've got 20 minutes in between doing it each well, time. Well, that's it. Yeah, you've got 20 minutes if you make that one mistake there, but you're already kind of thinking about the next couple yeah. of sectors and making sure you nail them. And then you're like, all right, I didn't nail that. So I've, n- now I've got to do I've got to do three more that I need to try and nail. And then, again, you're going on and on and on. And before you know it, you're back and, and you try and remember and to it make all. it worse, it's once a year. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. Or once every three years in the minute. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> it's a one-off. So you you picked up on that, Steve, but I think it needs more more emphasis talking about it. The fastest ever newcomer. That is is a title that I mm. mean, it could stand forever. Nah, do you not think? Nah, records never stand forever. There's, there's actually it two. Could stand re- for a long time. Yeah, there's two records from that week. So I actually is the fastest first night newcomer as well. Um, so I did. So I did 109 mile an hour was my first lap. My mm-hmm. second lap was 115. Uh, and then I did, I managed to squeeze one more lap in, which was then, a, so, so my 115 mile an hour was a flying lap, mm-hmm. uh, and then filled the tank back up, and I managed to get one more lap in, and I did 115.1, I think, standing start, and short lapped as well, so normally you lose out on a bit of a short lap, so it'd have been slightly faster than that, and that's the fastest anyone's ever gone on night one even as well, which I didn't know before that even not even happened, but yeah. So, take us back to first night, are you... Do you, like what's going through your head? Are you? Oh no! I was do you so know? You, do you realise yeah. you're so fast? No, because I asked the team not to tell me. I was like, do not tell me what lap times I'm doing. Don't. I literally don't want to know. When I come in, fill the tank up, check the bike out. If everything's good, I'm. I'm. I go out again. Just go again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I did 115, which obviously I find out afterwards. So you're not but, trying uh, to go as no, fast no, as you can. No, I had no idea. And then the next night, I actually did 117 standing start, and then 119.6 <laughs> was my fifth ever lap. It was 119.6. But again, I, I still had no idea. And Paul Phillips actually came up. I don't know if he ever remembers, but he came to me in, on that second night and was like, mate, you need to slow down. Da, da, da. And I was like, why? What, what are you on about? <laughs> and he was like, do you not know how fast you've gone? I was like, nope, no idea. I've already told everyone, don't tell me. And he went, oh, okay. And then he kind of went, kind of really, I think he thought I was trying to chase something that I wasn't chasing. I was just riding by myself. Exactly the same for me. Yeah. You know, um, obviously a lot earlier. But uh, my... My first year, you know, in, in, I think I was the fastest. I was fast ever newcomer then, and then after me, Josh Brooks, and then and then Pete. But um, I was lucky enough to have, and that was, I was going to be my next question for you. But I was lucky enough to have Mick Grant in my corner for my first year. He's obviously very experienced, seven times TT winner, and a great guy. But he was straight in my ear. You're trying too hard. You're pushing too hard. And I didn't even have a clue what my lap times were. You didn't feel like you were. I think because I didn't know you weren't trying to yeah. beat your time every time you, you you threw a leg over a bike, you know. So for you, what about dad and mechanics? Nobody, <laughs> nobody was giving you ear, ear no, ache. No, 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 no one gave me ear ache at all. To be fair, um, so I took Daz, who's my crew chief now and team manager for for FHO Racing. Um, I took him and I took another guy called Kev, um, who works uh, or yeah works quite a bit with uh, Hell Brake Line Company. They were they were my two guys on on my bike for the for the Northwest TT and Ulster that year. Um, I just had them two just looking after me only, so they didn't have anything else to concentrate on apart from me and my bike. And uh, obviously, mum and dad was there, but everyone was pretty pretty chilled out, you know. So we just made sure the bike was good. I was my usual chirpy, chilled out self, and uh, kept filling the bike up with fuel and putting tires on it, and off we go, enjoy myself. Yeah, clearly <laughs> to the point where we we nearly hit 130 miles an hour <coughs> in your first ever. Yeah. TT. Yeah, 129, 104, was it? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh... <laughs> I mean, you two just like... It's, 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 it's bread and butter for you guys. That is what it is. But for someone like me, that's that's absolutely insane. Going out at 109 for your first lap is... Some people will go around the TT for years and never go that fast. <laughs> it's yeah, I don't know. Everything's just different. Isn't like it? to you, yeah, that's it. You don't see that as one person's as fast as another person's yeah. slow and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it, it was it is impressive. Even from the from the final race and doing 129 mile an hour, I should have done 130. There was there was a couple of things that happened on that lap that stopped me from doing it. And it wasn't because I was even trying to chase 130. I had no idea what I'd done. Um, I did 126 in my first superbike race on the Saturday. Uh, in the stock race, I think I did 125-ish, something like that, 124 maybe. And then in the senior, uh, I'd done 126, then I'd done 127, but I didn't know. And then, yeah, my last lap into the pits was 127, I think. And then obviously 129 on the final lap. Right, I want to I skip this on because we have to talk about it when me and Pete went on a track day. 
<laughs> no, we'll talk about it. Uh, 2018, obviously. Yeah. But before we get to it, go back to that first year. Was there any moment for you where you're like, I'm not sure about this. This is this is a little bit too dangerous for my liking. No, or, do you know what? I've never thought it once. Really? Not, not in any, not in short circuit road racing. I've never had that thought. Just, just refine that question. What was your biggest <laughs> eye opener in that year? I don't know. I don't know if I had one really. I don't mean negative. No, I mean as a learning process. I didn't. I don't know. I don't. I'm not an overthinker by any means on on anything. Um, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not. Yeah, I don't. I don't see things like that. I don't go. Oh wow, look at that. I'm not. I don't know. I can't think of something that would that came into my head straight away, going, "Oh my god!" Apart mm. from, for me, the bigger the circuit, the better. And the Isle of Man is just ridiculous for that because it's so diverse, and the sections where are really short circuity, then the sections that are really big, fast, open, and long. And I like that the track has all of them different things about it and the longer tracks always get that so somewhere like Alton Park is one of our longest tracks in the UK yeah that's a bit like that where it's got real fast open flowy sections and then it's got real nudgery sections as yeah. well and I, I like the the diversity in the track um and obviously TT is the epicness of that isn't it it's got absolutely everything and then some so I guess that the fact that you can go around that track and probably the, if I'm going to name one thing it, it's been sat in sixth gear for so long a flat chat flat out you don't get to do that many places in the world Northwest, obviously you can Ulster you can um, and TT is uh, again has the, has the best amount of that so 2017 you signed for Smith Racing and you had a, a relatively successful shall I call it relatively successful TT yeah, yeah it was good five, five podiums five podiums and five races <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should have won the senior, really, but yeah, didn't, didn't quite plan out. So you 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 you've stayed with Smiths for quite a while, and and you're quite synonymous with them, mm. especially with with, yeah, with especially what you've done TT, with them. Yeah. yeah. What what made everything click then? Why why five podiums from five races? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Really, I mean, I should have had podiums in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in fact, even in year two, so year two in 15 in the Super Stock race, I should have finished third on the. I, I was actually. So, so close to being third on the podium in the Super Stock race and the bike ran out of fuel, which I was gutted about because I told the team boss at the time before TT even started, the tank's not big enough and they disagreed and I ran out oh, of really? fuel, which really annoyed me. Um, <laughs> By how much? A lot? No, I think I, it was le in the end, it was less than five seconds I lost the podium for. So is that why you turn your engine off now when you're rolling up to the <laughs> yeah. line? I think it probably is one yeah. of them things that's like then set in my head afterwards. Like I'm so conscious of <laughs> yeah. fuel all the time. And I'm like always saying to the team, make the tank as big as you can. Like you just got to. It's How many litres? 22? You're allowed 24. Right. So to me, it should be 23.95 or something daft. Yeah, yeah. Like it literally needs to be on the limit because otherwise you'll just catch a cold. And that's, I think it was something like 23.4 and I argued that that wasn't big enough and <clears> I got told to stop being an idiot. And then I missed the, like, it wound me up so much. Yeah. <laughs> because in year two to get a podium, and I know obviously Steve's been one of the few that's that's won with a very short time. There's not many people that can. Yeah. And I think now probably even less so because it's a bit more... Focused, maybe, is probably the best way of saying it. I don't know. Um, the, the, the competition is so, so strong, and the lap times are so fast. Definitely. I mean, that's your flipping fault. You, <laughs> you, and, you and Harrison, of mm -hmm. course, yeah, the, the, the level's moved on. Yeah. You know, I think I think when I got there, the level stepped up, and then and it has since massively in machinery and, of course, talent, you know, and um, which is fabulous and great for the spectators. It's a, it's a brilliant spectacle, but... Without doubt, it's difficult to go there now and uh, you know and perform without an awful lot of mileage uh, to know where you go. Yeah, in your first year or two yeah. years, it's 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 really hard. So, so that annoyed me in year two, and then year three, I should have been on the podium again uh, a couple of times. It's super stock again, and we had something stupid. We had the wheel valve I actually came undone on a brand new wheel, which was ugh, something. Yeah, I yeah. was really lucky actually. I thought the shock had collapsed. I actually did. So I did 123 and a half mile an hour in lap on lap two with what I thought was a shocker collapse and actually there was no air in the rear tyre. No air in it? <laughs> no air in it at all. So From massive, what point? Yes. So, for, well, I did at least a whole lap <laughs> with no air in the rear wheel, which just tells you, uh, or one of the real other reasons why I'm a Dunlop ambassador, because 
there are not many tyres that would be able to do that and stay on the rim and yeah. stay supported enough to actually do a lap of the Isle of Man TT. I did 123.5 mile an hour average with no air in the rear tyre, which is unreal, really. When yeah. you think about it now, you're just like, it doesn't actually make sense. And obviously, if I'd known, I'd have pulled over. Yeah. But I thought the shock had broke and I was just sat on the spring because that was the feeling that I had from the right, bike. Yeah. The tire anyway. was the spring. The tire was the spring. Because <laughs> <laughs> even in the pits, I'm like, the shock's bust, the shock's bust. And they're filling the tank up and they're like, no, 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 shock's fine. I'm like, what? <laughs> it can't be. And then I went to set off and I actually pulled the bike over. So I set off from the pits and I stopped at the end of pit lane because I was like, no, there's something wrong. And I was like, what is the point? You know, I, I probably, I should have been on the podium in that race. I wasn't. Um, and I knew there was something wrong. So then I was like, in my head, I, I literally set off from the pits and thought, why am I bothering then? If there's something wrong. Yeah. Why am I, why, why am I putting myself through that danger? So I just, I actually stopped at the end of pit, pit lane exit and just pulled the bike over to the side and jumped off it. Is that when um, you found out that there was no air in it or did you still? No, it was out? later. Right. Because I was like, there's something wrong. I basically went back. I was like, look, there's something wrong. I'm not riding it. And everybody went, yep, we agree. So, you know, the whole team were, were well on my side with yeah, that yeah. sort of thing, which you always need a team to yeah. do that, not the opposite. You know, I've, everyone I've ever surrounded me, myself with are people that are supporters, not pushers. Yeah, yeah. You know, they support your opinions and what you would like to do, but they don't push you into doing You're the one riding stuff. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then later that week, I was third in the senior on the first uh, first and second lap of the senior. Um, so I was actually in front of John, which, is a, which was, for me, I was like so excited about and yeah. then it dropped a valve on the run up Halewood's rise <laughs> on lap two which I was so gutted with I should have done probably 133 that year uh, I did 132 so it's still good I think I can't I think my standing start was 131.8 and that was year three uh, and we had loads of other problems that year but um, I only did six whole laps on the superbike in the whole and that included a six lap race on the in the first superbike race so i'd not ridden the super bike there at all until that year and i didn't do many laps on it at all so coming into to, uh, the, my fourth year 2017 i was really ready for to be on the podium and i think it all kind of came right and came good at the same time and bikes were all good they never missed a beat um and yeah there, there we ended up five podiums from five races and Again, the senior, I actually led, that was the first time, that was the first year I actually led a race. Um, so the senior, the first start, because Hutch, that was the year that Hutchie crashed uh, yeah. onto the mountain mile. Mm -hmm. uh, me and Hutchie were actually swapping first places on that first lap and three quarters, uh, which is the first time I'd seen a pit board with P1 on it at the TT, which was nice. So did you leave that year, think, slightly gutted that you'd not taken a victory or...? No, I wasn't too bad. I mean, obviously yeah. I wanted to win, don't get me wrong, but Ooh. at the same time, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You come back the next year and, and have another go. That's that Again, that's been my main mentality of not, you know, not putting pressure on myself either and being happy with basically whatever happens. Obviously, we all want to win, but yeah. I'm not going to do absolutely everything it takes to win. I'm not that person. You know, if it's not right or something's not right, like what happened in that Superstock race, if I feel like something's not right, I won't do it. So moving on, 2018, the Superstock race, you know, I can remember uh, being in the pit lane with a microphone and it coming over the radio that some flipping amateur had gone straight <laughs> on on the first lap. Um, I'm actually blaming you for this anyway. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. He's <laughs> proper racer. He's got a filing cabinet yeah, full, full of, of excuses. <laughs> Talking to people always trying to push you. <laughs> <laughs> so talk me through it, Brad and Bridge. What had happened was, Steve, <laughs> all week you kept telling me you you should be winning these races and you're not because you were too slow on your first half a lap. <laughs> and I wrong, kept saying, but... I know, but I'm just no good on first half a lap. So I have to say, well, you need to go faster. <laughs> <laughs> as so easy that, as that he doesn't care he's finished his career he's like yeah just honestly just keep it wide yeah, open just keep it wide open yeah we've done the super sport race and um so you're kind of up to speed anyway but then you jump off the super sport bike and get on the stock and yeah they're a different animal you know you're going 30 40 mile an hour faster and mm -hmm. yeah I, I just I, do you know what? i probably could have made brad and bridge and again it comes into that point of will you do anything to win that race or not and i I won't. I will always err on the side of caution. Um, and I hit the brakes and I thought, <laughs> I'm in deep for, for making Brad. And, and I had to make a decision there and then. Do I throw it in? Probably would have made it. But if I don't make it, I'm going to either crash or I'm going to hit the wall on the right-hand side. What, what, what do I gain from that? 
So my decision was I can just go straight on, stop, turn around, three-point turn, come back. Yeah. All right, I'm going to lose a load of time. Or the other option is, A, you possibly make it, or B, you end up in a wall. So I was like, <laughs> well, I'll just go straight on then. Yeah. And I, I literally, that was my thought process in that, what, 0.2 of a second. That's what decision I had to Brilliant. make. And I made it there and then and went, I'm just going straight on. So, so, so Brad and you've come... I'm not. Well, I'm just over a mile in. Yeah, <laughs> basically ruined my race within a mile and yeah. a half. Yeah, um, but it's a, it's a, it's it's coming into a, a right hand bend. Then no, quarter, quarter bridge is the right, and then you've yeah. got a left right. You got left a short, right. Sorry, short yeah, straight yeah, yeah. between the walls, and then yeah. you've got yeah. a, a, you know a left and a right. But you know, in all fairness, your body's not up to temperature. The bike's not up to temperature. Yeah, tires yeah. not up to temperature. You got a full tank of gas. Mm -hmm. It is difficult for an amateur <laughs> to, <laughs> to judge. That point. <laughs> and I judged it wrong. Here. <laughs> However, it clearly didn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there wasn't... I knew I was fast on the stock. I've been fast on the stocker all week. I was pole every single practice that we did all week on it. So I knew I was fast on it. I won at the Northwest on it, which was my first Northwest 200 win as well. Um, so I knew I was quick on it. And, yeah, unfortunately made that mistake. And oh, Yeah, not a mistake, but I made a decision that, that, that meant that I lost a load of time. It was 11-odd seconds or something, but... I, it's also a four lap race it's a long long way anything can happen um, my first board I got I think I was ninth so I was a long way down and in my head I was like oh, that was stupid why have you done that and yeah. then by the end of the lap I was actually third and within four seconds or three seconds and I was like oh I've actually got here we I, go I, I, I'm, I'm alright on this and then yeah. from that point onwards I was like oh, well I must be way faster than what them lot are so crack on yeah and uh, yeah that ended up being the first win and lap record on the last lap which was nice and I think that was a race where the back markers definitely worked in my favour you know Michael um, I can't remember he must have been number six I would have thought that year mm -hmm. and uh, and he hit a load of back markers on the last lap I only caught one or two but towards the end and by which point he'd been kind of ruined with back markers and I was I was good so uh, the number definitely worked for me in that in that particular instance. I want you to talk me through from the Craig on the last lap of that stocker race, yeah. you know, that that feeling inside you, you know, knowing it's all to lose if you make any silly mistakes on that last part of the lap, and just down, obviously down to the uh, winner's enclosure. Yeah, excited more than anything, and I think I was thinking about fuel because <laughs> <laughs> that's where it all gone wrong. A few a few years previous was was the run from Keppel Gate. It was it was shunting out of fuel there um so i was yeah it was a long way before so that's why i was all i've always been really conscious of fuel since that moment um but yeah i was just, i think i was just excited more than anything and that um i don't know if uh, i class it as a famous tt shot now that there's a shot coming on the run down to the craig of me sideways right by the white line that is the last lap of that stock race so it's actually the super stock bike um yeah. and it's an awesome picture it's fourth gear there through through keppel gate and then kate's cottage um, yeah, absolutely mega. I think I was just, I knew I was fast on the mountain already by this point, although maybe other people hadn't known, but I understood where I was strong and weak. And uh, I knew I was I was in with a shout. And obviously, I didn't know the back markers were holding Michael up either, but I think I ended up winning by three or four seconds anyway. So actually, I had a good gap regardless of back markers. Um, but yeah, I was just, yeah, excited and point to point where I needed to be. And seeing all the fans cheering and you know the supporters at the TT I think are a different breed of people as well they really get behind anyone who's at the front like it doesn't matter I don't think people have riders they don't like particularly in road racing I think everyone likes everyone yeah and you know whoever's winning everyone's happy and uh you know seeing all them programs and people waving and and the pit board down there that I have at the Craig and stuff, it's just, yeah, it's just cool. There's, there's no feeling like it in the world, I don't think. I don't think there's anywhere that gives you that buzz. So fast forward to the end of the week, 2018, the senior. Now, some people say that this was one of the best races ever between mm. you and Dean Harrison for the senior win. Now, I can't wait to get Carl Fogarty in this room <laughs> and ask him well, the same question. Well, he'll definitely tell you something different. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to say, my, my favourite was 2009, senior TT. TT. <laughs> <Get in there. laughs> Some people say commentators curse, but I like, I like this, man. I like it. <laughs> it's definitely up there, though. It's definitely up there. A incredible, an incredible battle. You're obviously very confident by this time. You know the bike was running well. However, Dean was riding really good. Yeah, well. strong, strong. And and Dean's always fast from from the off the mark. So that was where me and him are very different. Is he's always fast immediately, and I always tend to take a bit longer to to build up. But yeah, it was. Um, I don't know. I think I knew where I could be stronger and. 
I knew that if I was within a certain few seconds in my head, I'd already kind of put, not, not planned, but I knew where I needed to be to be able to still win. And that's kind of where I sat all race. And I didn't really show all my cards until I had to. Because the other thing is, if you broke down on lap five, I'd never actually have to show my cards. And then you just keep that yeah. for the next year or whenever. You you know, you only you win at the slowest possible pace. And I think a lot of people forget that. Like even now, people are going, oh, you're going to go to the TT, you're going to go smash the lap record. And my answer is, yeah, if I, if I need to. Yeah. So let me, let me stop you there immediately. <laughs> <laughs> 130 what is it 135.454 yeah. is it 452 452 and that's the slowest possible pace is it we well it was right? to be able to win that race at the time <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> talk us you know just just enlighten the people listening to that kind of a pace around the tt course how does it feel for you could it have been faster? Uh, yeah, it definitely could have been faster, yeah. And I'm sure you you must have watched the onboard as well. And there was lots of bat markers in places. And and I wasn't particularly harsh with the bat markers, I don't think. I think I definitely could have been more ruthless than what I was. Um, and it cost me because of it. But, again, it goes back to that I'll not do it at all costs. It's You've got mm-hmm. to use your head. But everything was just good, you know. I mean, that was the same bike that I'd ridden in 2017. So it's the same bike that I'd ridden in BSB, Northwest, TT, Ulster, Macau in 17. I then did BSB, Northwest, TT on it, Ulster on it, and then Macau in the end in 18. But it was the same bike I'd ridden for a year and a half, let's say. I knew it inside out. We had not changed a click from the year before to that year, which is really unusual. Um, the bike just worked straight away. Dunlop brought us a different tyre during the week because it was something that we'd or I'd complained about and I know some of the other guys had complained about a certain area on the on the bike that I wasn't happy with and no matter what I had done previously I couldn't get the bike to, to change that all of our feedback went back to obviously Dunlop and then Dunlop came up with something not overnight but something they've been working on and then they brought it for us on the Wednesday I'm not sure I, it was whatever the last senior practice was and it might have been Wednesday night that week or it might have been Thursday depending on the weather I think it was Wednesday I rode it and loved it straight away, and I was like, yep, that's just got rid of exactly the problem that I had. So then after that one-lap practice, I knew that I was in, even in a much stronger position than what I had been up to that point, and just, yeah, I felt at one with the bike, and that lap was not poetry in motion, but just I wasn't thinking about it too much. It just happened, and I knew where I needed to be. I knew how I had to push, and I knew how I wanted to do it and it just everything worked as it should done the only kind of unknown in that was the bat markers and that was it do you do you know that you're in this titanic battle because obviously we're watching the highlights afterwards and you know the subsequent years every time I want my TT fix that's where I go back to (laughs) do you know you're in that battle or do you yeah you kind of concentrate on your own thing and really not worrying too much about what Dean's doing uh, I wasn't worrying about what he was doing I I was watching how far ahead he was going so Mm -hmm. I would judge i wanted to be roughly within five seconds on the last lap that in my head that's where i wanted to be so if you know i think the the most it ever got to was seven seconds and when it got to seven i brought it straight back to three or four so i kind of i judged everything off that the whole race and then it was only the last lap that then was like right all car like everything on the table do what you need to do to, yeah. to win it, you know. And, and obviously he had a load of back markers as well. There was there was back markers everywhere, as there always is in TT racing, but I knew where I needed to be. And I knew if I got to Balaf Bridge and I was de- within five seconds, I was like, I, I, will, I will beat him because I knew how strong I could be over the mountain. Um, you know, I was already kind of between two and four seconds. And I think on that last lap, I did four seconds in one sector. So it was like, I didn't just beat him a little bit. It was a lot. Yeah. And I knew that I had that in me. It tickles me because I was, you know, working uh, with the TV cameras. I, I I cover the pit lane and I'm in there for the pit stops, of course. And you, oh, of course, you know, the big battles, Hickey and Harrison. And in in true Hickman style, he pulls in and I'm trying to not get a word out of him, of course, because he's, you know, there's a lot of things going on. But just try and get a little bit of um, read his body language and just see what's going on. And honestly, he looked over to me and was kind of the attitude of bothered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And away he goes, you know, and just... Yeah, let record pace it's yeah. incredible incredible mate. yeah because yeah. I think we'd broken the lap record on that lap 4 as well wasn't it so that was 134 or 4 I think but like just slightly more than what Dean had done in the superbike race earlier on in the week but yeah it was um, yeah I'm just chilled out <laughs> <laughs> amazing now we could talk about it forever 
because it is one of those moments in TT history. But let's just talk briefly of 2022. Yep. You know, we're heading towards TT now. Finally. Finally. Yeah. You're looking forward to it? Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? Yeah. Big, big changes. New yeah. team, owner, you know, same structure really within a team. Pretty much. New bike, as you've already mentioned, with the wings and very, you know, um, and two years off. Yeah. Well, it'll be three years, won't it? By the time any of us get to go down Glen Crutcher Road, it'll have been three years, minus two weeks, since any of us have been down. So it'll be... Uh, yeah, nice shock to the system, I think. <laughs> if there's such a thing as a nice shock, but no, it'll be um, it'll be good. It we I, I can't wait. Yeah. Absolutely. And what is Pete Hickman riding for TT 2012? Uh, so I'll be FHO racing for the Superbike class on the M1000 RR, and also the Superstock class on the M1000 RR. Uh, and then everything else is almost not up for grabs, but I'm 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 certainly hoping to be on the 765 Triumph. That's that's my plan. Um, so th- through my company that we touched on briefly before, PHR Performance, we are the uh, contractor for all Triumph engines as far as the Supersport class goes. So if you were to go and buy um, a 765 bike to go Supersport racing, in British Supersport, let's say, you buy your package from Triumph, the bike and engines actually come to me first. All we right. do the engine conversions to the Moto2 kit, seal them all up for you so that you can't cheat, and then uh, give you the, the end product. So that's what my aim is. to be, to. I'll probably run my own Supersport bike um, with that PHR connection. Uh, and then the last one is the lightweight. So I will be on the lightweight, and I still have uh, a Norton, which I rode at the last mm-hmm. 19 twin race yeah um the only norton that finished i think all week <laughs> so i i still have that bike um and we've been doing a lot of work on it um so it will look you know, actually from the outside it'll look probably very similar to what you saw already but you take the fairings off it will be very different underneath mm-hmm. um same engine actually uh same engine and chassis and stuff but just completely different ideas of how to make the thing work. Now, it's clearly a stupid question to, to ask if you go in there to win. <laughs> Every rider goes to yeah. win. Do you think you can just hit the ground running? Because you mentioned it earlier, you can get there and you'll be you'll be back on it like that. Yeah, I mean, the first few nights, I think, will be... I don't even think there will be that steady. Yeah. I just don't think there will be, especially if we have a good Northwest, because the Northwest always runs before the TT. So if Northwest is dry and, and runs really well, then I think... 100% you will not see slow lap times from any of the front guys at uh, at TT. If there's a bad northwest then yeah maybe it'll take a night or two before before you start seeing some good lap times but uh, yeah I honestly don't think TT will be very slow at all. And has Pete Hickman been over to the Isle of Man doing a few Do you know what no laps at all? No, I haven't been since 19. Really? So I have not been back to the Isle of Man since 19 yet. So um because I know Dean's obviously been over doing lap after lap after lap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the, has he been doing just the mountain section? <laughs> yeah. He's back on a plane now. Yeah. He's booking exactly. his flight. He's yeah. going. I'll just go and check it out just to make sure. Yeah, just see which way. Uh, yeah. No, I see. Um, I saw Glenn. Uh, Glenn tweeted the other day saying he's he's been doing some laps and stuff. And uh, I already said to Glenn. Um, if he ever wants any help, you know, I'm more than happy to to help out and try and give him some pointers and keep him safe more than anything. You know, it's yeah. uh, you know, TT's it's a big big thing, and uh, you know, you can get yourself in trouble very easily. So, you know, or anyone who ever goes, so you know, they need to be taught the correct way, not the wrong way. So, mm-hmm. um, he's going over in December, and I said that if I'm if I'm free, I'm happy to go over with him. So if that if that works out, then I will be there in December at some point having a, a lap or two. Meant. Right, Pete. Now, I know we've been talking for quite some time. It's been brilliant, in all fairness, but you've been fabulous. You really have. Right, a few quick fire questions for you. Now, you can only answer these one or the other. One or the other. One or the other answer. There's okay. no description or anything. Staffordshire or Lincolnshire? <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> Lincolnshire. Outright lap record at the Isle of Man TT or a race win? Race win. Pillion ride with John McGuinness or Dean Harrison? Oh, John McGuinness. <laughs> 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 I won't be able to hang on with Dean, I don't think. Bray Hill or Balagheri? Balagheri. Last one, British Superbike title. I know you're a massive, obviously, uh, competitor at BSB and had a fabulous 2021 or a senior TT victory. Oh, that's harsh, isn't it? That's not very nice. One or the other. <laughs> uh yeah, but I've already won a senior, so can I have the Superbike title? <laughs> you can have whatever you wish. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Let's just finish on this um, 
touch touch on this subject. Um, it's fairly well known that you um, you have a good relationship with Iron Maiden. They've sponsored a few of your bikes over the time. How did that relationship come about? Uh, quite a long-winded conversation, really, but I'll shorten it. Go. Um, friend of a friend of a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, right place, right time. Um, with Robinson's Brewery, actually, in Stockport, mm-hmm. was was one of the connections. They then sent it. That was through a friend of a friend of a friend. Um, Lizzo is her name, who, who sorted all that out for me. So a big thanks to Lizzo, because it was, it was her that instigated the whole thing. They Robinson's got hold of it, and then they sent it on to Phantom, who are the band management for Iron Maiden. Uh, the lady Sarah, who sits on their PR side and does a lot of their promo stuff and things, she is a biker. She's mm-hmm. got her own bike on the road and stuff. Landed on her desk, and she basically picked the piece of paper up, went to her boss, and went, "We need to do this." Brilliant. So uh, yeah, that's that's how it all came about. And actually, it turns out the guys are all pretty into it. Yeah. Uh, especially Bruce. Bruce. Bruce loves the Isle of Man TT and stuff. And they're often sat on tour. They have been in the last few years sat on tour somewhere, and they've actually got the live timing up while they're on tour just Brilliant. to see what's going on. Because unfortunately, they've not been able to actually come to the TT and watch themselves. So they've uh, they've had it. On, on lifetime, on which is pretty cool, yeah, yeah. They've been going for so long. Was it 1972? I think was the first album they released, and they are still going. And they are still massive. Have you ever been to one of their shows? No, unbelievable. Really, unbelievable. I've been to a couple now, obviously, and uh, yeah, you get free tickets. Yeah, yeah I can see. I see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Always on the blind. Always. Always on. Hey, I'm from Yorkshire. What do you expect? <laughs> you got a t-shirt next as well. Have you? you got one? <laughs> <laughs> so, is, would you say that's your most famous fan? In Bruce and uh, Iron Maiden, yeah, definitely one of yeah. I would say yeah that them and Gas Monkey, I, I guess, with Richard Rawlins is. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I've been I've been seen in and around with Richard a few times. Yeah. Um, been over to their place in fifteen and stuff, and yeah, I've been I've been a few times actually with Richard. So I'm trying to get him to the TT as well. Oh, nice! But he's a he's a pretty pretty big star. Hey, Steve, who's your biggest fan apart from me? My big my my star, the man. He's actually got two of my old race bikes, Mark Knopfler, Dice Straits. Really? Yep. Oh, he used to sponsor cool. us. Yeah, back uh, back a few years. Not not on the roads in North Hence, but uh, British uh, super sport. Yeah. Oh, mega. Uh, see, you weren't expecting yeah, that, were you? I wasn't. <laughs> I try, you know, I've never tried to compete karaoke with him. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon you've got a good singing voice. Ah. Right, shall we wrap this one up? Let's get it done, mate. Cheers, Pete. Thank you very much. Cracking, relaxed as always. Thanks, Pete. Cheers, guys. So there we go, Steve. In the bag, episode one with Peter Hickman. What an interesting chat. And I was right. He is as horizontal in real life as he is he is at the TT. Yeah, very laid back, you know, rushing around back from, from Italy and, and doing his stuff. But, you know, he's uh, nothing really changes with that man. What do you think his chances are of, of I don't want to say dominating, like we've discussed, he's only been winning for the past couple of years, but he looks like a man who is more than capable of jumping on a bike and just winning consistently. Do you think we're going to see that or do you think the competition is just too deep nowadays that, you know, we're not going to see anyone dominate like we used to in the past? He's obviously got the pace. He's running very well at British Championship and that keeps his mileage up. You know, um, he's happy with the team, with his surroundings, with the brand he's riding for, BMW. So everything's going great from that side. However, he hasn't really been under pressure yet. It's very easy to be nice and relaxed and easy going when, you know, when everything's running smoothly. But it's when you're under serious pressure. You know, he's he's mentioned that, you know, on the last lap, he knew he could knuckle down and, and bang in lap record style pace to, to take the win. Mm-hmm. But when you're not quite sure in your own mind, that's when it becomes difficult. This has been episode one of the TT Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then please hit that subscribe button and leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We have plenty more star-studded names from the world of TT on the way for you in this series. And here's a little taste of what you can expect from next week's guest, the one and only John McGuinness, MBE. There's a lot of people stood at the pub saying they want to be this, that and the other and a TT rider, but to be actually do it, get your licence and be stood there with a TT entry and have... Have uh, the old boy got all your shoulder? <laughs> He's got all your tight until that flag drops, and away you go. That next episode will be out in two weeks' time, and don't forget, you can get all the latest TT news and features over at iomttracers.com. And be sure to check us out on all the usual socials. We're at TT Racers Official. Thanks for listening. <laughs>